Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for waiting so patiently. We are back now with our next session at the Rajan Kilachand Mughal Tent. The title of our next session is Banned in India. And the speakers that we have with us are Hansta, Subendra Shekhar, Mridula Garg, and Paro Anand. They will be in conversation with Salil Tripathi. The session is sponsored by Matra Bhumi. To introduce the speakers, Salil Tripathi is the author of Offense the Hindu Case, The Colonel Who Would Not Repent, and Detours, Song of the Open Road. His next book was about the Gujaratis. He chairs Penn International's Writers in Prison Committee. Born in Bombay, he studied in the United States and has been a correspondent in India and Singapore. He lives in London and writes for The Mint and Caravan. Our next speaker is Paro Anand. She has been honored with the Sahitya Academy Bal Sahitya Puruskar Award 2017 for her book, The Wild Child, now published as Like Smoke with an additional content. Recognized internationally and locally, including by President Kalam of India, she headed the National Center for Children's Literature, which has interacted with over 300,000 people, primarily children in difficult circumstances. Her book, No Guns at My Son's Funeral, was on the Ibi Honor list and is translated into German and Spanish. The Little Bird Who Held Up the Sky with His Feet was on the 1001 books to re read before you grow up, an international gold standard of the world's best children literature. Mridula Garg, who was here before for another session with us, has written in every genre in Hindi. Her ninth novel, The English Language, The Last Email, has just been published. Of her eight other novels, the most famous, Achita Cobra, which is also available in English, German, and Russian, Katha Gulab, Country of Goodbyes, in English and Woodrow's in Japanese, the Sahitya Academy Award-winning, Mijul Man and Vasu Kakutum. Lastly, also with us, is Hansa Suvendra Shekhar, who is the author of a novel, The Mysterious Ailment of Rupi Baski, which won the 2015 Sahitya Academy Yuva Puruskar, and a collection of short stories titled, The Adivasi Will Not Dance, shortlisted for the Hindu Prize 2016, and is compulsory reading at the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, our panel. Thank you very much. Um, I'm recovering from a very sore throat infection, so pardon me for not having the, a booming voice today, but the mic will help me. Um, the theme is banned in India. And one of the unique features of books being banned in India is the fact that there is no one authority which bans them. There are many ways of banning them. There are, there's a central government, there's a state government, and some of you who are old enough might remember that Satanic Verses, which was quote-unquote banned in India, was never really banned by the government. Only its import was banned under the customs laws of India, which means in theory someone could publish it here. And of course, if someone had published it at that time in India, one might have seen the kind of scenes that one has been seeing about a film all over northern India, certainly, at this point. So it's, it's very interesting about who bans it, and how, how the bans are enforced, and what happens to writers. Because the writers write stories, they write sometimes non-fiction, they write from their own experiences, and they tell the truth as they see it. Sometimes they speak truth to power, sometimes they write the truth as they see it. Um, but it, many people don't like that. And because they don't like that, they often take the law in their hands. We have three kinds of, uh, three different kinds of stories here today that we are going to look at. Um, in the case of Shekhar, he wrote a collection of short stories, The Adivasi Will Not Dance, and it was threatened with a ban, and his effigy was burnt, and there was a successful campaign against him on the Facebook, on the social media, saying that what he's doing is terrible for the community. And briefly, it was successful, and to some extent, it still is successful, and we'll hear from him when he talks about that. Mridula Gurd wrote the novel Chitta Cobra in Hindi, and this was in 1979, nearly 40 years ago. And uh, she actually faced arrest, and she has a wonderful midnight knock story two years after the emergency was lifted, a few years after the emergency was lifted, but a midnight knock of another kind, and she will talk about that. And finally, we have Paruan, and she writes for children, and children, in a way, are willing to accept and talk about things and open to ideas, but adults want to decide things for them, what they can and cannot read. In this India is not unique. 
There are many countries where parents' association, teachers' associations tend to dictate terms of what the kids can read. And each year during the Banned Books Week in the United States, you see a list of books that are banned and, um, and in schools. And it includes classics like Catcher in the Rye, uh, Sometimes Gone with the Wind, and most recently, of course, Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter series. So, I mean, writing, um, even if you do write for children, it doesn't mean children would get to read them. That tends to take place. Banned books are often seen in only in the context of both Salman Rushdie on one hand or Taslima Nasreen on the other. But what we are going to see here today are three writers talking about their own experience, what it feels being banned, what it is feel when somebody takes action against you, and how do you deal with that, and how do you cope with it. Uh, Mridula ji, I'd like to start with you. Can you tell us the circumstances of the threats that you faced? The arrest itself, that midnight knock story, and the subsequent event. What we are going to do is have three, three questions, one question each, and then they are going to read parts of the work that was so contentious. So please. Well, uh, there are uh, different uh, ways to uh, ban a book. There is or censor a book. There is the state censorship which you uh, mentioned, and there is the censorship of the street, uh, which is religious censorship or just goons censoring it, or uh, the market censoring it whatever, moral policing. So in my case, it was a collusion between the street and the state. And here the street was represented by a very reputed magazine of Times of India, Sarika, mm -hmm. which uh, published an extract of the book. And along with that, published a letter from a writer, a woman writer, who declared it to be obscene, adding that she had not read the book. She was basing uh, her ideas, her uh, opinion, only on those two pages which had been published. And along with it, the, right, uh, the editor um, invited other letters of the same kind. So you can imagine, uh, as my sister said, if you throw food on the street, dogs will come. So uh, for one whole year, uh, vicious, vulgar letters uh, kept pouring in and were published by this magazine. And nothing was done. Uh, that was considered freedom of expression. I contacted the Authors Guild of India. I contacted the bosses at Bennett Coleman. I contacted other writers. All of them said, this is free expression, freedom of expression. After this went on for one year, I was arrested by the Delhi administration. Now, everybody knows Delhi administration doesn't read books. <laughs> so somebody must have complained against the book. And the nicest people in the whole uh, event, in the whole episode, were the policemen. Two policemen came one night to arrest me. I don't know why a woman policeman did not come. One woman police woman did not come. Uh, but at that time, I wasn't very conscious that they are men. But they were very nice about it. And they said they felt very ashamed to come and arrest me because they had read my things. But their uh, senior officer insisted that they get the book. And for one year, they stalled it. And then he finally went and got it from the Parliament Library. So by that time, the book was in its fifth edition, and it was in the Parliament Library. When they woke up to the fact that the author needs to be arrested. So the uh, book's sales were, uh, the book, uh, stocks of the book were sealed by a publisher was arrested, and I was arrested. But I was released on bail, so I never went to jail. And this had a Kafkaesque quality. So though I was also very frustrated and a bit angry, I was extremely amused. And that is what really helped me go on writing my other novels. Because every month, the chief secretary of Delhi administration assured me that it was a complete mistake, that no way could I be arrested, and the case has been withdrawn. And then after every month, the police would land up at my place. So I, then he would say, the file has got lost, or the file has got misplaced. So it was, it was really funny. It was hilarious, the whole thing. And I wrote a very hilarious article on it called The Night I Was Arrested. But it is not really hilarious. The, there are two, two facts emerge from this. First, when goons do something, even if the goon is represented by a reputed magazine editor, the state does nothing to protect you. Yeah. The second is that the state yeah. colludes with the goons yeah. to arrest you. Now, this is a very obnoxious situation. And the worst part of it is that uh, it has not improved. It has not improved at all, as you see with Padmavat. That is my story. 
Did you get a lot of support from the writing community? Not at all. Not at all. I can count on my fingers the people who supported me, and their letters were not published by that editor. One was my writer's sister, Manjul Bhagat. One was one uh, very weird writer called Yogesh Gupt, who was considered a rebel and you know a total outcast. And uh, there are one or two other writers, Mrinal Pandey. And what turned the wheel was Janindraji. Janindraji supported the book, and uh, he used a sentence which I will have to say in Hindi. He said, "Agar sampadak ka sam nikal do, to kya bachta hai?" And this editor is behaving like that. <laughs> so th when that happened, then you know they stopped. I mean, the, after one year of uh, vicious campaign, they stopped the campaign because Jenenji had used, almost abused them. You know, the uh, editor almost cried. He said, "You know, Jenenji has said this." But the writer community, to date, has not expressed any remorse, any regret. And all my contemporaries, who are now all rebel writers, they never said once that this was wrong. In 40 years, they have not said once that this is wrong. They all pretend that it never happened. You know about 100 years of solitude, Marquez has written about uh, genocide, you know, where next day they all pretend that nothing yep. happened. This is something United like Fruit that. United Company yes. incident, yeah. Uh, so they all pretend that nothing ever happened. So Chitkobra is never mentioned. Mm. Even when I got the Helmin Hammond grant, all the languages of India published that news, excepting the Hindi newspapers. So let's read out. Read an extract from that. I'll read the very extract which was considered obscene, and you will be surprised that you'll not find anything in it. I'll read it in English because we are conducting this in English. I always knew beforehand when Mahesh planned to make love to me. Long experience had taught me. These are husband and wife, by the way. As soon as I came to know of it, I began to turn into a creature of the flesh. I decided to take a bath that afternoon. My mind was fully involved in the cleansing of my flesh. I washed my body with the same attention to detail with which Mahesh washed his car every Sunday. I was more ruthless more like a nurse getting a patient ready for surgery. I rubbed my feet clean with a pumice stone, the heel, sole, and each of the toes. They went white, then grew pink with the scrubbing. They looked like a pair of robins. I fell in love with my feet. <coughs> Shyly, I touched their pink heels, the dimpled soles, the baby soft toes one by one. This tickled me. I kept stroking them tenderly. The dull ache turned into undulating waves of pain that rose to a peak, then flowed out. I wanted someone to smother them with his hands, then to kiss them. No, I did not lose sight of my goal. I knew my body was not just my feet. There were other parts of it, and each had its use. I left my feet to their fate. I took each part into my hands, rubbed it mercilessly with soap, then washed it. No one could escape from the attack. My mind stood resolutely on guard ruthless in the execution of its duty, till the time came when I was reduced to nothing more than a living mound of flesh. Mahesh's hands were kneading my breasts. He had powerful and beautiful hands, square fleshy palms, the long tapering fingers of an artist. Passionate would have been the music that would have flowed from the sitar had his fingers run on its strings. But I was the instrument his fingers used for his musical practice, not I, my breasts. Suppose the whole of my body had been a breast, an enormous, gigantic, palpable boob, round like a globe, Mahesh could have lain sprawled on it. His lips and hands and feet could have played with it, sucked and mauled it and trampled upon it at the same time. He would have squeezed the nipple with his lips and at the same time pummeled the rest of the breast with his powerful hands. It could have borne his cruelest blow. Its increased dimensions would have lent it the power. It would have throbbed like a piano under his fingers. Violent, tumultuous music would have filled the room if only I had been a massive boob. Mahesh's lips would have left mine to latch onto the breast, helping his fingers to bruise it. My senses would have exploded within me. I would have moaned with passion. My passion would have touched him. His lips would have mauled the nipple, his fingers grown savage in their flagellation, and he would have entered my body long before now. Now his lips were on mine. He had pushed my mouth open with his tongue, 
and taken possession of mine. The tissues of my tongue were tingling. I was only a tongue. But his hands were on my breasts. Two fingers formed a noose, tightened round the nipple, twisted and pulled it and thrust it away. I understood he wanted his lips to molest it now. He must be yearning for three pairs of leap lips. He could then keep one pair on my lips and one each on my boobs, or he could have pulled them close together and captured both with one pair of lips. He could then put the third pair on the lips within my legs that panted even then in expectation of his imminent penetration. But he had only one pair of lips, and they were busy helping his tongue. Had my body been an enormous boob, he would not have been put to so much inconvenience. His lips and fingers could have assaulted me at the same time. My eyes were closed, but my body lay awake. It toted up every touch of his. I could not see anything. The room was in darkness. I was grateful for that. But my body was familiar with each stroke and shot of the game being played on it. To make love was a game, an art, a need, a demand of the body. To love was stupid. My body was a sentient being. It produced well the elaborate engraving carved on it. Many of the flowers had been etched with its active participation. It was the fountainhead of desire. This my body, it was I. My eyes were closed. I could clearly hear right there in my room the tinkle of ankle bells, the beat of the tabla, an exquisite rhythm. Not for a moment did the beat falter. Whenever I was with Mahesh, that sound held me in thrall, those women who sold their bodies for money, they who were nothing but flesh. They immersed themselves in the worship of the flesh once they had the money in hand, but they worshipped music and dance too. The body is the music and the dance too is the body. The body is the Lord and the invocation too is the body. The body is the spirit and its ecstasy too is the body. As long as the body is pledged, the heart and the mind are irrelevant. But it is not greedy. As soon it, as it extracts its due, it lets go. Once the body pays back all its debts, every bit that is due, it will be set free. It can then go to sleep, if it so wishes, till the next installment is due. Every part of mine was in contact with some part of Mahesh's body. My body was still torn into fragments, but the cohesive touch of his body on mine had, just for a moment, integrated it into a single whole. What was I but a body, and that too not mine, but Mahesh's, his touch and his flesh? Mahesh entered my body. It was nothing. This intercourse between man and woman, nothing, but an inherited intense longing in every man to fill a hole. Our bodies merged and lay as one on the bed, writhing, moaning, sweating, for the currents of ecstasy to sweep over us, till the final shock left us insensible with a last shuddering cry. Mahesh could then go to sleep, and I could open my eyes after casting aside my half-asleep body. The darkness of the room was peaceful. What of the body? It went to sleep eventually, always did. But let me first go to the bathroom and wash it all away. The blue marks are of no consequence. They would go away on their own in a day or two. Shekhar, yes. social media haunted you. Yeah. There were Facebook pages calling for all yeah. kinds of things to be done to you. Yeah. you. You're a fantastic writer, and you were getting the kind of reception which you thought you never would. Tell us the story. Um, uh, I think the campaign which was started against me on Facebook and elsewhere on social media, mostly through Facebook and WhatsApp, I think it showed the character, I think it showed the character of those people who started it, rather than what they were, you know, objecting to, that is me or my writings. And uh, it is a very sad thing that this campaign was started by so-called educated people, and who are, you know, not just school or college educated, but they have gone to universities, they teach in universities, and uh, they, you know, they call themselves the champion of Adivasi issues or Adivasi rights or whatever they might be you know, championing for. And uh, they started it on Facebook. They claimed that 
The story which I had written, November is the month of migration from the collection, The Adivasi Will Not Dance, it did not portray Adivasi, especially Adivasi women, in proper light. But the way they were behaving on Facebook, like they were, you know, tagging their friends to speak against me or to bully me, and the way they were harassing not only me, I could have, you know, tolerated it, but they were also harassing people who were coming to my support, and there were women friends of mine on Facebook who were speaking in my support, and these campaigners, they were talking about them. So it was quite ironic that they are talking about, you know, women's issues, or they are talking about uh, protecting women, and then they were, you know, bullying women on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And the height of, I think, this came when they created a parody page in my name. And on that page, they used a photo of mine from the Jaipur Lit Fest in 2015. And in that photograph, I was with two very well-known women. Should I name them? Sure. Yeah. Okay. They wouldn't but mind them. They won't mind it, of course. They were proud to have been with you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One was Urvashi Butalia, well-known publisher. And another was Marina And president Penalva. of Penn Delhi. Yeah. And another one was Marina Penalva Halpen, well-known literary agent of Pontas Agency. I had this photograph of, uh, with them, and then they used that photograph, and those people, you know, they, when they created that uh, parody page, and they said, these are the kind of women who read Hansa Savendra Shekhar's writings. And I was like, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> I mean, it was embarrassing. <laughs> I mean, it was, I don't know whether they were feeling embarrassed or not, but I was feeling embarrassed. Yeah, and the worst part was, you know, it could, if it was only on, on, in the virtual sphere, it would have been fine, mm -hmm. but it had real life consequences yes, for you. Yes, yes, They came, they had they, your refugee uh, burned, I, I they complained in, to your employers. Yeah. I work in Pakur, which is uh, a place in Jharkhand, and uh, they came one day, and then they decided that they should, you know, burn my effigy. And uh, I think uh, it was a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, uh, five days after that, I was in the OPD working, and just 700 meters from my office, they burnt my effigy, and uh, one of my staff from the office, he went there, and then he came and told me, sir, apna putla dehan ho gaya hai. <laughs> and I was like, bhoot badiya baat aur kya ho sakta hai? So it, had it ended with just putla dehan, effigy burning, chalega. But <coughs> those people, they actually influenced the political system or whatever they did. And then in the assembly, the MLAs, both from the ruling party as well as the opposition party, they, uh, you know, I don't know whether they had read the book or not. Like they Mridula wouldn't have. They hadn't. Yeah. Like Mridula ji said, uh, Delhi uh, municipal, uh, what was that? Delhi administration wale, <laughs> not municipal. <laughs> Delhi administration wale kitabe nahi padte hai, so jharkhan mein bhi shayad politi uh, politicians kitabe nahi padte honge. Because they did not, uh, you know, they did not present the book in the assembly. What they did was in a newspaper, I think it was Hindustan, the news about my effigy burning and the things which were happening with me, that was published. And uh, so the MLAs, they waved that newspaper. Had they waved my book, I would have been happy. But no, they waved the newspaper. And then the MLAs who were themselves at one point of time accused of, you know, harassing women. Like one of the MLAs was accused of uh, harassing his own bhabhi, sister-in-law. So those were the kind of people who themselves have been accused of harassing women. They, you know, tried to protect the dignity of women and they tried to show that they respect women by having a book banned. And, and what's the status now? Because there was a ruling uh, I, against yeah, it, right? Yeah. I, the status was never clear because I do not know whether it was just a, you know, whether it was just a stunt carried out by the government to quieten people or it was really a ban because uh, in December uh, they said that, you know, four weeks, uh, for four months after they, dis, um, uh, they declared that my book had been banned, they said that the ban had, has been removed. And this is one of the interesting parts of book bans in India that there's no central repository where you can find out which books have been banned, when, and if the ban is for a particular period, how long. So if you try to put together the list, it's almost impossible. I mean, you'll have to literally send an RTI request to hundreds of government departments and states. And then also there might be some where only the university has withdrawn it from syllabus. So it's a 
It's complicated, yeah. It's complicated. Do you want to read out a short extra? Uh, yeah. Why a short? I'll read the entire yeah. story. I'll read the story, <laughs> yeah. the migration one. Yeah. That's a really fine story. But Salil, uh, before this, I want to thank the um, Adivasi scholars who first wrote this um, article in Scroll against uh, this online campaigning against me. Uh, then uh, there are 13 of them, and their names are listed in alphabetical order of their last names. First is Ashish Biruli, who is a journalist and photographer. Lipika Singh Darai, she's a National Film Award-winning filmmaker and film editor. Joba Hansda, she's a research scholar at the TISS Bombay. Ruby Hembrom, she is the founder of the Kolkata-based publishing house Adivani. Priyanka Priyadarshini Marandi, she is a research scholar at IIT Delhi. Sneha Mundari, she is a filmmaker. Cyril Murmu, he is a filmmaker. Akash Poem, he is the founder of the website Adivasi Resurgence. Priyanka Purti, she is a student of IIT Bombay. Nora Samad, she is the program assistant, Eklavya. Priyanka Shandilya, she is a research scholar uh, at TISS uh, Tuljapur. Sujit Kumar Soren, he is the director of the Santhali Academy of Sidhu Kanumurmu University, Dumka in Jharkhand. And Ashish Khaka, he is a PhD scholar at the TISS Bombay. And yes, here is the entire story. November is the month of migrations. Come November, Santhal men, women, and children walk down from the villages in the hills and the far-flung corners of the Santhal Pargana to the railway station in the district headquarters. These Santhals, villages, entire clans, make up long snaking processions as they abandon their lands and farms to take the train to Namal, the Bardhaman district of West Bengal, and the paddy fields there. In the month that these Santhal families will spend in Bardhaman, they will plant rice and other crops in farms owned by the zamindars of Bardhaman. 20-year-old Talamai Kisku is among the 43 people making this journey tonight. She, along with her parents and one of her two sisters, most of her village, including her three brothers and one sister-in-law, has already left for Bardhaman. Talamai is the second daughter in a family of three girls and three boys. Her name reflects a certain lack of imagination. She is the middle daughter, Tala, middle, my, girl. Talamai's family is Christian. One would have expected Talamai's parents to be learned enough to think of a nice creative name for the daughter. Yet, despite the promises of education the missionaries made, Talamai's parents never got to see the inside of a school, and neither did she. They either gathered coal or worked in the farms of Bardhaman. Talamai walks away from her group. She has been attracted by a man. He is young, fair, a diku. Diku is the Santhali word for people who are non-tribals. And a jawan of the Railway Protection Force. A bread pakoda in hand, he has signaled her to approach and has disappeared round the corner. Talamai debates if she should follow and decides to. He is offering food, after all, and she is hungry. It is 10.30 p.m. and they still have about two hours before the train arrives. Are you hungry? The Javan calls out as Talamai rounds the corner. You need food. He's standing in front of the policeman's quarters. Yes, Talamai answers. You need money? Yes. Will you do some work for me? Talamai knows what work he's talking about. She has done it quite a few times by the Koila Road, where many Santhal women and girls steal coal from trucks. She knows many girls who do that work with truck drivers and other men. And she knows that on their way to Namal, Santhal women do this work for food and money at the railway station too. Yes, Talamai says, and follows the policeman into the dark, into a paved space behind the policeman's rooms. The work does not take much time. The policeman is prepared. He spreads a gamcha on the ground and takes off his treasures. He also has time to slip on a condom. Talamai, too, does not have to undress fully. She just takes off a lungi and saya. She knows the routine. The policeman grabs her buttocks, raises them, and adjusting Talamai, penetrates her. Then he starts pumping, grunting, as he heaves himself into her. Talamai lies quietly, observing the changing contours of the policeman's face in the dim light. At times, the policeman grimaces. At times, he smiles. Once, he says, Sali, you Santhal women are made for this only. You are good. Talamai says nothing, does nothing. At one point, the policeman squeezes her breasts out of her blouse. He bites them and sucks on her nipples. That hurts. Don't scream, the man pants. 
Don't speak a word, it won't hurt. Talamai takes care not to scream or even wince. She knows the routine. She has to do nothing, only spread her legs and lie quiet. She knows everything is done by the man. She just lies, passive, unthinking, unblinking. As cold as the paved ground she can feel through the thin fabric of the gamcha, as still as an inert earthen bowl into which a dark cloud empties itself. In less than 10 minutes, the work is done. The policeman heaves himself up and helps Talamai to her feet. He throws the used condom away and wears his clothes. Then he gives Talamai two pieces of cold bread pakora and a 50 rupee note and walks away. She reties her saya and lungi, stuffs the 50 rupee note into a blouse, eats both the bread pakoras and walks back to her group. Turning to you now, um, as, as I said briefly in the introduction, I mean, you write for children, yeah. and the responses you get from them are quite different from the responses that you're getting from the yes. adults. Yes. So I want to know both about the kind of re reactions you're getting from the adults, and then how it has been with the children. Yeah. Um, it's, I, well, for one thing, I'm feeling quite left out. I've neither been arrested nor have any of my refugees been <laughs> Oh, but, but you're disliked. <laughs> That's important. <laughs> Your dislike. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, please, <laughs> I'll have some effigies made, and you can burn them. <laughs> um, you know, when No Guns at My Son's Funeral came out, it was the first book of its kind for young people. It's a terrible title, No Guns at My Son's Funeral, and. Um, just before it was to go into print, we decided to show it to some school principals, some parents, and many of them objected to the title, and we changed the title to um, Kashmir, the other side of childhood, because it deals with a 12-year-old who becomes uh, a terrorist. But the night before it was to go into print, I, I couldn't sleep, and I called the publisher next morning, I said no. This is the title, it has to remain, No Guns at My Son's Funeral. And so we just went ahead with it. Luckily, the publisher was brave enough to do it. And um, whenever I have a, a session with children, and I hold up a whole lot of my books and say, which one do you want me to read from? It's always this book. And say, why? Because they love the title. So it's mm. that wide... Um, a, a difference in, in response. Uh, if I can, I'll just read from, Please, from yes, this yes. book. And the way it's been banned is that uh, it is recommended in some schools. It went on to win the Sahitya Academy Bal, Bal Sahitya Puruskar. But on the other hand, it went into some schools. Some teachers decided it was a good book and it was being taught in schools. Uh, but suddenly a WhatsApp group got started by some parents saying this is a terrible book, threatening the school with closure, with being de-recognized, saying that we will report you to the CBSE, and the school decided to withdraw it. As soon as I heard from my distributor that they said I'm from my publisher, um, I, I called the school and I said, what was the problem? And they said, we don't know. So I said, let me meet the parents. Let, let's have a session with them. Let's, let's see what it is that they're objecting to. And let's approach it with an open mind. Don't admit to a mistake you didn't make. It wasn't a mistake to have recommended the book. But they never let me uh, meet with the parents, and the book just got withdrawn. Did you get messages on WhatsApp or telephone threatening uh, you? or? insulting you? There, there, were, there were some messages saying that you should be careful of what you're giving to children to read, what it is that you're writing. Please be careful. I mean, careful, I don't know. It was a bit of a scary word yeah. that you should be careful. Um, however, credit to one of the principals who said, um, I'm going to put the book back into the library and if children want to read it, they can read it without too much fuss being made about it. 
uh, but the book has been banned in several schools. No guns at my son's funeral also. Again, it's recommended reading in some schools. And in some schools where I go and the principal says, we like your work, we really like what you write, please don't read from No Guns and from Like Smoke, because those are very dark books. And those are very touchy books is how they've been described. Growing up, we never had, we had open shelves. In, at home, at school, you could pull out any book you wanted. But if I could yeah, read... Please, of course. Uh, this is a story from Like Smoke, which is a collection. This is called the yellow, Those Yellow Flowers of August. I hate Muslims. I always have. This is not Paro Anand's words. These are words that I heard in a school the words sort of came to me and pierced me. I looked out of the window to see who had said this, what was happening. And there was this girl who loudly had said, I hate Muslims. And other friends around her were nodding in agreement that yes, they hated Muslims too. And that's when I noticed one child who was standing, alag se, rooted to the spot, ashen-faced. It was obvious that he was Muslim, and I knew that this was a story I had to write. I hate Muslims. I always have. Well, almost always. Ever since I learned what Muslims were, those people who are as black as the clothes they wear, long black beards for the men, black shrouds for the women, shrouds as if they are the walking dead, which in a way they are. Not that any of it matters to me. I don't hate them for their clothes, why should I? I hate them because they're first class bloody killers. They're a bloodthirsty lot who have nothing better to do than run around killing people. And I know this for a fact, cold blooded fact. The blood that day was red and flowing and real and hot the only thing that was cold that day were the hearts of the killers. So many people died that day in a bomb blast in the market. But I don't cry for them. I cry for one, my father, my beloved father, whose only fault was that he went to the market to, buy, to, to work so that he could buy goodies for us. It was my mother's birthday and I never saw my father again. And so I hate Muslims. Since that day, I hate them. It was them that did it, and I want nothing to do with them. If I could, I would kill a few myself, but I'm no Muslim, so I'm not into killing. So after the father's death, they move away from Kashmir. This has happened in Kashmir. They move to the Nana Nani's house, the grandparents' house and uh, they put her into a big international school where it's the first day of school, although it's August. Um, uh, we all sat in a circle to introduce ourselves, and I noticed this really good-looking boy sitting across from me. He looked at me too, and he smiled, sort of, and I smiled back, just a bit. Your mic is... And I smile, is that better? Um, and I smile back, just a bit. I got a funny feeling in my stomach, and I had to look away. Though I couldn't stop smiling. Butterflies. Yes, that's what they were. My, us girls back home used to talk about love at first sight, and I'd always said I didn't believe in it. But right now, I wondered if that's what the butterflies were. The name spun around me as the teachers asked us to introduce ourselves. Bandana, Bijoya, Priya, Vipin, Amar. I couldn't really remember them all. Besides, I was concentrating on the good-looking boy. I leaned forward to catch his name. Well, I caught it all right and dropped it immediately, like it was a burning hot coal. Khalid, he had said. Khalid, a Muslim name and I hated him immediately. I shot him a furious look, and I didn't know if he saw it or not, but I hoped he had. And then the children are put into pairs, 
to do a play on anything that they want to. It was a strange sort of school where they were playing these getting to know you exercises. And of course, as luck would have it, I was paired with the only Muslim in class. What are you so angry about? Came a voice behind me. I whirled around. Of course, it was Khalid. Hi, I'm Khalid, and you're Nitya, right? He held his hand out, but I was damned if I was going to touch him. These people are filthy, I've heard. Hi, I snapped, putting my hands firmly behind my back. OK, he smiled, looking at his hand as though he felt sorry for it. He had a really nice smile. I mean, a really, really nice smile. Behave yourself, he said to his hand. Can't you see that Nitya is angry and doesn't want to become friends anymore, and doesn't want to become friends right now? He smacked his right hand with his left. Hand says sorry. I hope you'll forgive it. <laughs> oh, it goes on. I, I, I won't read the whole thing. But um, so they decide on a play that they're going to do. And, but she is completely unresponsive. And he says, all right, let's pretend that there was a beautiful princess whose hair framed her head like a halo, so she looked like a princess of angels. But there was an anger in her, a fire burned deep and dark. Many people came to try and put the, fire, the anger out. Many tried to cool its heat with songs and music and food and dance. Handsome princes and wealthy kings came. But did the princess's anger subside? No. I said, you know, you're quite right. Nothing worked. But then one day, a joker arrived. Oh, he wasn't good looking or anything. Yes, he was. What's that? He, he, he was good looking. Well, I mean, I mean let's pretend he was, the, he was good looking. Ah, a good looking joker, huh? All right. Could you describe the joker, please? And of course, she tries to describe something as far from Khalid as possible. By now, I was pinching myself, reminding myself that I had to hate this, this guy. I was pinching the wrists, the inside of my wrists, till they were raw and bleeding. It was a habit I had got into after my father had died. Khalid's face grew suddenly dark and clouded. He fell silent dropping his eyelashes, shutting out those honey eyes. What, had I done something? He sat there quietly. You're really, really angry, aren't you? He whispered. I don't know why you're angry, but what I really don't know is why you're angry at me. Did I do something? What could I say? I couldn't tell him my anger, could I? But I couldn't stop the tears either. My father died, I sobbed. I'd never said this out aloud to anyone, never in those stark, unchangeable words. My father died. He was killed. Who? Who did it? I looked at him. I hoped he'd understand. Muslims. There, I'd said it. And now he could hate me back. He, we could go from trying to be friends to being enemies forever. And in the end, of course, um, not only do they become friends, because he says that bombs don't have a religion, um, they fall in love, and they have a kiss, one kiss, in the school. So that's what supposedly some parents objected to. But my sense is that it was because it was a Muslim boy and a Hindu girl who oh, kissed. Oh, love jihad. Love jihad <laughs> happened Absolutely. right then. And what, what the reaction has been of children, just before I end, is that I was really surprised here in Jaipur a few years ago when I read this story. And this young boy said um, something that a lot of people say. There's this discourse of learned hatred going on. And he said that, ma'am, uh, I'll agree with you that all Muslims are not terrorists. But you'll have to agree that 
almost all terrorists are Muslims. And what do you have to say about that? And it's a common argument. So I said, all right, let's put away the question of religion for a moment. Let's take the case of rape. And let's just look at the case of rape separately. He said, we can all agree that all, uh, all men are not rapists. But you'll have to agree with me that almost all rapists are men. So what do you have to say about that? So does that mean that we should, <laughs> so does that mean that we should start treating all men as potential rapists? And I said, so better you. I should treat you with hatred and suspicion, although I know nothing about you, by your logic. There was dead silence. The kid was mad for a minute. He clenched his fists. And then he started clapping, and the whole audience was up on their feet clapping. And the child said, no one has ever explained it to me the way you have, in a way I could understand. And that's why we have to unban these stories and Absolutely. have them there with kids. Absolutely. <clears throat> I'm, I'm conscious of the time, but I do have questions for all of you. Yeah. So if you can keep the responsive brief, and I'll leave it to you who wants to respond. And I do want to keep at least five minutes at the end to the, for the audience. But first, is, do you feel you have sufficient protection as writers when something happens? I mean, you mentioned that you didn't really have support at all. In your case, a few I, did speak I, up. I, I received a lot of support from yeah. my, where's my mic. <laughs> I received a lot of support from writers, Salil and everyone. Thank you so much. I can never forget that. But I want to take one name, you know. One name, one person who stood. Um, so something the matter with the mic? Matter? You can't hear me without the mic. No, no. Now we can, yeah. Now there was one uh, writer, one, uh, one man called Dinesh Duvedi who took out a small magazine called Punash. And he took out an entire issue on Chitkobra and published all my letters and everything that was on it. And the editor of Sarika threatened him. He said he'll have him killed. And uh, he'll uh, do everything possible to him. But he did not bow down. That issue came out. And he kept on uh, arguing in favor of Chitta Cobra. That is one name I should have taken, which I didn't. So I want to make amends sure. for that. Uh, yes. Um, so Sorry let me continue this. Uh, no problem. Um, uh, I received support and you know protection from writers. But writers job is not to protect people. It is the police job, the administration's yeah. job. And the kind of response I received from them, like after my putla dehan, the effigy burning, I went to the th local thana and told them that my effigy has been, I uh, gave it in written to the thana that my effigy has been burned, so I'm afraid for myself and people around me, people who work with me, my dear ones, that something might happen to me or to them. So kindly uh, uh, do something to protect me. So uh, they said, they just said that, uh, sir, we can't do anything, keep bodyguard. Rakh and I was like, look, sir, I work in the midst of people. I go for, you know, like we have this pulse polio drives and, immun and this Im uh, immunization program. And I have to go into villages which are far from the district headquarter uh, alone <coughs> to uh, monitor those programs. So do you think I can take a bodyguard along with me? Isn't there something which you can do right here, you know, against those people who did this? And they said, no, we cannot. And another thing, uh, uh, in one of the official letters, it was um, uh, um, in which I received here, yeah, it was written um, in which this explanation was, uh, you know, asked from me. I was told that a law and order situation has been created in the state because of the book which you have written. Ek, uh, uh, what was that? Vidhi ya kanun ka samasya utpan ho gai hai. And I said, bhaiya, I mean, I did not say it loud, but it was in my mind. Bhaiya, kitab se kanun ki samasya utpan ho gai hai. I mean, there's a law and order situation because of a book. What are you guys doing then? Yeah. I mean, it is your inability. Aapki, aapka nikam apan hai if you're not being able to handle that law and order situation. <laughs> it is not the book's fault. I mean, if your, um, uh, what was that, Aapka Khufiya Tantra, if your intelligence reports are saying that there's a law in this situation, then you should, you know, handle it. You, um, uh, you shouldn't actually uh, silence someone and uh, stop a book 
on the pretext that it is, you know, making a law and order situation. You find out people who are making the law and order situation. A book is not making. A book zinda insan nahi hai. Zinda insan are making law and order, law and order situation. A book is not making a law and order situation. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. <laughs> We are on the 10 minute marker, so let's have some questions from yeah, the audience. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm going to recognize someone, the lady at the back there, over there, and then the gentleman in the red here. Let's, and keep it short, and if you're directing it to a person, say who it is for. No, we can't hear you. No? They don't want us to speak, actually. Oh. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is yeah why don't you ask first? We'll yeah, come to you. So. We'll we'll come <laughs> so, it's not a criticized uh, question. And uh, I will read it in Hindi uh, for Paru Ananji. Keep it short, yeah? Yeah, sure. Yeah. मैम हम ये मानते हैं कि ये देश वास्तविक और कामिसूत्र का भी है और उतना ही कबीरदास जी का भी है जो शरीर को मिट्टी मानते हैं हमारी संस्कृति में आत्मा परमात्मा के मिलन की भी बात आती है मोक्ष परम सति ये भी बात आती है तो आप बॉडी यानी शरीर को लॉर्ड स्पिरिट ये सब कहकर बताकर लिखाकर या पढ़ाकर क्या जताना the best solution to something that you find offensive is not to read it. Shut the book. Yeah. I think that's the best way forward for you. Yeah. Question, please. Yeah. Don't read books at all because books will always be not like Kabir and Meera Bai and all necessarily. Yeah. And you should object to Meera Bai also because she made a lover of the God. Hmm? She turned God into lover. So and you left should her be husband. against. Yeah. Yeah. You should be against Meera Bai also, and you should be against Kabir because he was neither Muslim nor Hindu. So who is left? Nobody is left. Or you have should, no Sanskriti left. Object. Or you, you should, should object, object to, to everything. The, so you should object to the up. Mahabharat where yes, a woman really. marries five men. Not, not no, right this reminds me of, you know, when the emergency, there were so many restrictions uh -huh. that Bahram contractor who was a writer in Bombay, Busy yeah. he said, you know what, we have only two topics worth talking about, cricket and mangoes. Uh -huh. <laughs> sure. No, no, even mango is, uh, has voluptuous content. Yes. <laughs> and cricket is corruption. <laughs> yes, please. Hi. Hi, my name is Simran. Um, my question is pretty short. So, um, as individuals, as writers, you're extremely strong, but as an individual, ma'am, when you were in the jail, or sir, when there were protests against you, or people made Facebook messages against you, did the fear get to you? Did, did in some way, at some point in life, stop you or pull you down and be like, I might as well just write a sad or sap sappy or happy book and get done with it? Did the fear ever affect you to a point where you got away from your writer's standards? No, never, never, never. <laughs> Never, yes. Never. In fact, I think I think it does the opposite. It spurs you on because now the the book that's uh, my book, which is coming out next, has pushed the boundaries much further. Where I'm directly talking about but rape and about transgender and thing, and it's still for young people. Yeah, please. But I want to tell you one thing: many writers who happened to be women told me after Chit Cobra that you might not have been afraid, we were. Mm. And we did not write so many books we could have written, mm. which we did not write. And they blamed me for being brave. They said, what is this bravery? This is stupidity. And the, uh, press the mic. Yeah. And this uh, opposition which I received, it actually uh, inspired me or rather pushed me to write more. Yeah, please. Good evening, sir. Uh, my name is Subhav. Hello. Yeah. So my name is Subhav. And my main question is that there has been a lot of debate on art, especially if we see for movies or books. And it, our constitution has given us a right of freedom of expression that we can express. And I think that is being suppressed. As writers, I want you to I just have a question that how we as individuals can stand up against such atrocities of people who are threatening us on Facebook, on WhatsApp groups, 
and maybe the media also. So, yeah, that's what the question is. Uh, some, uh, most of the people who actually threat, uh, uh, who you know, threaten you, okay, or threaten us, I should say, threaten us. Okay, they, uh, most of the people I have seen, they are like just no, kagaj ke share. Okay, they are not actually. No, attack bhi kar sakte hai, theek hai. But the only, uh, you know, the way out is like, for us is to produce more such work. Yes, that is, that's it. Salman Rushdie had said it, that the best way to deal with speech is to have more speech, not less. But this, uh, definitely the laws, uh, the state should do something more. They should punish the kind of people who are objecting against Padmavat or who object against writers. Do they are never punished. They are never punished. The police, police will probably supply them with effigies to burn instead of preventing do, do it. Do come to our session tomorrow where this issue will come up. It's the, the rhetoric and the republic where this issue will get discussed. Any more comments? Yes. Only one more question. Uh, yeah, the hand there. And uh, there are two. Can we take them two rapidly? Go on, and then 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 the one at the back. Very quickly, one each. Yeah. So, My question is from Parwan Anji. You have given two examples of rape and uh, terrorism. They don't match anywhere. When rape happens, it is from a personal man's mind. It is from a bad person. It is from a bad person. It is from a bad person. But the terrorists are made in the name of the religion. That is why it is not from a comparison. So this is from a comparison. You have given a wrong comparison. I believe this. Sir, please. मेरा सवाल यह है कि आप ऐसे कंपैरिजन देके किसी इतनी बड़ी समस्या को आप एक छोटी सी समस्या में तब्दील कर देते हैं ये बहुत ही गलत बात है। दोनों बहुत बड़ी समस्याएं हैं, दोनों बहुत बड़ी समस्याएं हैं और हाँ बिल्कुल अलग है। मेरा मकसद ये था इसमें कि जो बच्चा 12-13 साल का जो बच्चा है, उसके दि� सुन के आई है, सो मैंने भी सिर्फ ये कहना था कि आप एक ब्रश से पूरे एक कॉम को नहीं पेंट कर सकते हैं, ये मेरा मकसद था। मैं बिल्कुल कंपैरिजन नहीं कर रही हूँ दोनों चीजों में। The last question, yeah. My question is, you know, in all the cases, the people who objected were educated people, editors, teachers, or other, you know, activists. So when there is an educated class which is objecting to this freedom, uh, do we not counter it or do others not counter it, you know, other publications or other authors and can there not be a counter movement or will that be giving too much attention to the issue and the best way is to ignore it? So, you know, there are two ways to look at this. But as civil society, we can't uh, let other parts just take over and have a dialogue which is taken over only as People are being harassed, but not that we, we feel helpless. I guess the question is, how do we tackle this helplessness as part of the other part of the civil society? Um, so I'll give you one example yeah. while, while you think of it, because I know we have two more minutes left. One example is that uh, what, you, what people can do is organize public readings of the works which are under attack. So you know, when Sovendra's book was under an attack, uh, I do remember that there were some people in Bombay and Delhi who decided to read from that. When Perumal Murugan was under attack uh, two years ago at the festival, we began by reading from his work. So give it more of a me, because some people want to snuff it out, so make sure there's more light cast on it, because that's what the book and the writer deserves. And I think that's one way of contending that. Absolutely. But please. Yeah, the same thing happened, you know, when, uh, my, when my book was under attack, since people did not stand up and support it, and when they supported it, those letters were suppressed by the editor. But till finally, Jenny Ng stood up and said, all those letters have to be published. So they were published. One voice is enough. One voice which counters the thing is enough to start a movement. That's what I feel. But everybody keeps quiet. That is wrong. You have to counter it. And Do we have time or are we out of time? One minute. One more? Out of time. Minute out of time. Minute. Sorry. Sorry. Thank you very much. And all I'm telling you is that do read the books. If you really object to it, read it, write a better book and counter it. Thank you so much. We would like to thank Hansa Soendu Shekhar, Mridula Garg, and Paro Anand, along with Salil Tripathi for being here with us today. We would also like to thank Matrubhumi for presenting us this session. Um,
Thank you so much. With this, we come to an end of day one at the Rajan Kila Chand Mughal tent. Uh, before we leave, I would also like to thank all of our sponsors. Z